last week we heard the horrific and heartbreaking news of 215 indigenous children whose bodies were found on the grounds of the Kamloops Residential School. And that news was searing and difficult because it reflects a truth about residential schools. It reflects a truth about the Indian Act. And it reflects a truth about the breaking of treaties that were made so long ago. I know that over the next several weeks, you will be listening to Indigenous voices in your church services, and I commend you for that. As I said in the statement I issued last week, now is the time to listen to Indigenous voices and to hear the pain and anger and wisdom in Indigenous voices. So I commend you for inviting Indigenous people into your, into your community over the next several weeks so you can listen to their voices. In advance of, of hearing Indigenous voices, I want to retell for you the story of our church's journey with Indigenous peoples in Canada. And it's a story about how we moved from being part of the imperial and colonial forces that caused great harm to Indigenous people, how we move from being perpetrators to being reconcilers, how we displaced imperialism and colonialism and, and, and spiritual arrogance and have sought to replace it with spiritual humility. It's a story of how the Holy Spirit worked in our lives to displace our comfort and arrogance and to replace it with compassion and wisdom. Our church, the Anglican Church of Canada, ran 26 residential schools over a period of about 100 years. And we were complicit in misguided government policy to aggressively assimilate First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. 150,000 children, some as young as five, were taken from their homes, their culture, their family, and placed in residential schools. And we believe about 6,000 children perished in residential schools. We do not know if that's an accurate number. The 215 children whose bodies were found this last week may or may not be part of that estimate of 6,000 Indigenous children who died in residential schools. And many say it's just the tip of an iceberg that's yet to be fully revealed. Over half of those 150,000 children are still alive today. And the intergenerational survivors, the children of survivors and the relatives of survivors are very much alive today and continue to reel from the effects of what has been called the cultural genocide that was committed by the government of Canada and with the complicity of churches, including our own in residential schools. Today, there are about 64,000 Anglican Indigenous people in Canada, and there are about 225 Anglican Indigenous congregations in our church. During the 1980s and 1990s, that community began to tell stories of what had happened in residential schools. Not the first time those stories were told, but the difference was the church was listening over the 1980s and early 1990s. And the children who were taken and placed in residential schools began to speak and their voices were being heard, leading to 1993 when the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Archbishop Michael Pierce, on behalf of our church, gave an abject, sincere, heartfelt, and humble apology to Indigenous people. Among other things, he said in that apology in 1993, 
we try to remake you in our own image. That apology marked a significant turning point in the story of our relationship with Indigenous people in Canada. That was the point where we moved from being complicit, from being a co-perpetrator to becoming a reconciler. That was when we began to leave behind our spiritual arrogance and to take on a posture of humility and contrition and to walk the path of reconciliation. Since then, the non-Indigenous Anglican Church of Canada has learned many things. We've learned to respect and defer to the voices of Indigenous peoples. We've learned to respect and to defer to the narratives of First Nations, Métis and Inuit. We've learned that we can use our status as a well-known church in Canada with a long history to make things happen. And we greatly influenced and enabled the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to come into being. After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have learned that we must listen to the 94 calls to action that were contained in the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we've learned to accept that self-determination is at the heart of those 94 calls to action, and that we as a church have accepted that a self-determining Anglican Indigenous church must come into being. And importantly, we've learned to walk humbly alongside the 1.7 million Indigenous people in Canada, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. In 2019, at General Synod, an Anglican Indigenous church formally came into being, and the structure and shape of that church will be revealed to us over the next year. A self-determining Anglican Indigenous church has come into being. And secondly, in 2019, a second apology was issued to Indigenous people on behalf of the Anglican Church of Canada. And it was an apology for spiritual harm. Uh, the first apology was an apology for trying to remake people into our own image. But this apology cut to the place where perhaps the greatest harm was done, and that was spiritual harm. Uh, damaging the souls of Indigenous children. And these are some of the words that Archbishop Hiltz spoke in the Apology for Spiritual Harm. Today I offer this apology for our cultural and spiritual arrogance toward all Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit and Métis, and the harm we inflicted on you. I confess our sin in failing to acknowledge that as First Peoples living here for thousands of years, you had a spiritual relationship with the Creator and with the land. We did not care enough to learn how your spirituality has always infused your governance, social structures, and family life. I confess our sin in demonizing Indigenous spiritualities and in belittling the traditional teachings of your grandmothers and grandfathers, preserved and passed on through the elders. And so that's something of the story of our journey from a place of spiritual arrogance to spiritual humility with respect to the Indigenous people of Canada. How God the Holy Spirit displaced ways within us that were not of God and replaced them with ways that are very much of God, very much in the spirit of God's reconciling love. The people of Samuel's time could no longer hear the word of God because they were no longer seeking to love God above all things and to love their neighbors as themselves. They were richly blessed, but they ceased to be a blessing to others. And so they turned to other things to guide their lives. Jesus came to displace the kings that people made for themselves, the kings that had put God to one side. Jesus came to displace the kings that rule 
our hearts, the things that we have created for ourselves to guide our lives and to replace them with his life and his love. And so to stay close to God, to stay close to Jesus in your journey, be Christ-like, love God above all other things and seek to love your neighbor as yourself. Wherever you find yourself, whether it's at work or at home or at play, do everything you can to bring the compassion and healing and kindness and justice and peace and hope and love of Christ in all that you think and do and say. Amen.